Welcome everyone. My name is Brittany Grindle and today's virtual workshop is on accommodations in college. I am joined by Cherry Harms of the Kansas State University. And Cherry, would you like to introduce yourself in more detail? Sure. Thank you, Brittany. I appreciate being here today. Um, as Brittany said, I'm Cherry Harms. I am an access advisor at the Student Access Center at Kansas State University. Um, my apologies if I'm a little froggy today. I have a little bit of a cold. Um, but if you'll bear with me, I hope we can give you some good information today. And uh, Brittany, are you ready for me to go ahead and get started? Let's go. Okay. Well, I want to welcome you all to this afternoon's workshop, and thank you for attending. Um, we will talk a little bit about the differences between high school and college accommodations. Uh, and then I will walk you through our process, but also relay how that might compare to other institutions. Hopefully this information will be helpful to both you and your parents if your parents are watching. Um, at the end, we should have plenty of time for any questions. As Brittany mentioned, you can put those in the Q&A or in the chat as well. And then um, we'll answer those at the end. And if I can't give you an answer, I will get your information and get back with you. Um, this is our office information. Our office provides academic and housing accommodations to students with documented disabilities. All campuses should provide accommodations. The name of the office may vary from campus to campus or it may be combined with another office, but every college should have a place that specializes in providing accommodations. Um, if you have a student with a disability or you are a student with a disability, you will want to inquire about this when you begin the application process to your respective school. Um, or if you haven't done that already, you will want to do that now. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be done at that time. It's just that the more you know going in, the better off you will be. Um, here we have our specific contact information. If you're considering K-State or if you have specific questions that you would like to ask, you can email that address at any point in time or, you know, and maybe get some questions answered by looking at our website. We're located in Holton Hall, which is that building on the top right. Um, for those of you who are familiar with our campus, Anderson Hall is the iconic building that's used to represent Kansas State. There's a semi-circle drive that runs in front of Anderson, and we are on the north side at the end of that drive uh, on a roundabout that you can see on the bottom picture there. There's that roundabout right there. Um, or as you can also see, we're adjacent to Hale Library as well. Our office hours are Monday through Friday from eight to noon and one to five. Uh, we do have voicemail if you need to leave a message, or you can email us um, as well, like I said, at any time. Our graduate assistants usually monitor that email address uh, and can get back with you in regards to any questions that you might have. So we'll first talk a little bit about uh, what are the differences um, about accommodations between high school and college. Uh, first and foremost, we are governed under different laws. Um, we're both governed under the Rehabilitation Act. High school is also governed under the IDEA, which is geared more towards success because we all want students to graduate from high school, right? Uh, so a student might get to retake a test if need be or have shortened assignments to help them work towards that success. In higher education, we are governed under the ADA instead of the IDEA, which means that we ensure access, not success. We provide the accommodations that will give a student equal opportunities, but we can't guarantee success. Um, things like shortened assignments or test retakes are not part of our accommodations usually, okay? The second thing that it mentions here is documentation. Um, a lot of times in elementary or high school districts, um, they will provide types of testing to determine a particular area of need. And then that documentation then helps them determine if a student is eligible for services based on specific disability categories. 
In college, students have to provide their own documentation or pay for testing, which can be a financial burden. Um, it can also take time to get scheduled. That documentation must provide information on the specific nature or condition of a disability. Um, it needs to provide any functional limitations and demonstrate the need for specific accommodations. The good news is that you can often carry over some of that documentation. Um, for instance, in our office, we accept 504 plans or IEP, IEPs, excuse me, when registering with our office. And we'll talk more about that when we go through our process, but it's important to check with the institution that you're looking at and just find out what they specifically um, require or need when looking at that documentation. The third area where there are difference is, is in self-advocacy. And I can't say this enough, um, learn to advocate for yourself. In high school, you often have a parent or a teacher or both who might be pushing accommodations or organizing meetings. Um, they might be even scheduling tutoring or study groups. Um, you might have those options in college, but you will have to seek them out. Um, your parents and your teachers won't be there to do that for you. Um, your professors expect you to read your syllabus and know what is expected of you in class. So make sure that you ask questions. Find out where you can find those resources if those are things that you think that you might use. Um, again, that's another reason why it's really helpful to get registered with your accommodation office. That disability office um, can sometimes give you those resources and as far as accommodations go, your disability office can't give you accommodations if they aren't aware that you need them. It's not like it is in high school where we see you all the time or we go to class with you or see you in the hallway. So it's really important that you advocate for yourself. The next area where there's some differences is with instruction and course requirements. In high school, teachers may modify assignments or due dates. Um, they may chunk up the information into smaller portions so it's easier to understand. Uh, they may go over a concept several times or even go over it enough until they know that the student has mastered it. In college, professors have a fairly strict timeline. Um, they only have 16 weeks to teach. So they expect you to be aware of that timeline and what's required of you. Uh, in college, they're not required to modify that curriculum design or alter assignment deadlines for accommodations. Students have a set of learning outcomes that they're supposed to achieve by taking the class. And those outcomes have to be met even if a student has a disability. So the structure of the class won't change. Students often have a lot of work to do outside of class, so you need to be very disciplined and understand time management. You need to go over your notes often, and the general understanding is you need to spend about two to three hours outside of class for every hour you are in class. Of course, you won't spend all day in class like you do in high school, um, but you will have to study outside of class. And studying for an exam needs to occur more than just a day or two in advance of the test when you're at that collegiate level. So those are the, some things that you need to keep in mind as you go into your college classes um, to set yourself up for success. Another area where things are a little bit different is in grading and testing. In K through 12, testing is usually over small segments of material. Sometimes the test is modified or even given until a student passes. Testing in college is usually about four times a semester, and the test format is decided by the professor. Um, you know, like in high school, sometimes you may have a student that does better on a multiple choice test than an essay test, and so they may alter that 
whereas you won't find that in college. Um, that format is decided on by the professor. Your finals are usually cumulative. Um, that means it covers a large amount of material. So if you miss a test, unless there's a very good reason, you usually won't be able to retake it. In K through 12, teachers will often frequently remind you about those due dates or specific assignments. And in college, you're expected to read the syllabus and use time management and make sure your assignments are done and turned in on time. You're considered to be an adult learner. And so that responsibility falls back on you. It isn't that it's hard, it's just often very different than what you're used to. So you wanna make sure that you are on top of it. And again, the last area is study responsibilities. Um, in K through, 12, K through 12, parents and teachers will often help structure study time or help you build time into your schedule for studying. Um, again, test preparation is usually a day or two before, and you usually spend, on average, about two hours a week outside of class with assignments or studying. And as I mentioned, in college, you're expected to spend about two to three hours outside of class for every hour that you spend in class. If you need outside help, you will have to advocate for yourself and seek that help out, uh, whether that's tutors, academic coaches, or needing help with time management. You'll need to seek out those resources. Again, the Office of Accommodations can help put you in touch with those resources. Um, but as I said, you will need to advocate for yourself. So what does that look like in the, at the collegiate level? Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the process works with our office. Uh, most offices at other colleges and universities will have a similar format, so you should be able to gain um, an understanding of how it works at that level. In our office, we have six full-time staff members and three graduate students. These are our access advisors. On other campuses, they may be known as disability support specialists, uh, disability support coordinators, disability advisors, those might be some of the names you run across. Um, we also do wear various hats in addition to doing access advising. Um, just as we have overlap, you may find that on other campuses as well. So you may not have a specific office that does those things, but you might look for um, some of that overlap as well. Dr. Jason Maceberg Tomlinson is our director. Uh, in addition to the colleges that he advises and his director duties, he manages most of the housing accommodation requests because uh, we do do housing accommodations as well. He has more than 20 years of experience having worked in Iowa and at K-State. Uh, Jason also serves on the board for Canahead, which is our Kansas affiliate for our national organization known as AHEAD. Uh, that stands for the Association on Higher Education and Disability. They help communicate processes for colleges and universities to stay fairly, fairly uniform in how the processes work. Jason has contacts all over the country, and he frequently talks with other institutions regarding their policies and procedures so that we can all try to stay up to date with all of that. Um, Dr. Lindsay Cabina is our assistant director. In addition to the colleges that she advises, she serves on a variety of campus committees, um, and she also oversees our testing center. Um, Lindsay also worked in accommodations, doing um, the disability accommodations, but also academic advising and financial aid at Highland Community College um, prior her to returning to K-State. Natalie Bahari also serves as our interpreting coordinator she is fluent in ASL, and so in addition to our colleges, she advises all of our students who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, she often interprets for them in class as well. She does some of our housing accommodations, and she teaches a sign language class on campus. I provide accommodation support for the College of Arts and Sciences, which means I often get incoming students who are undecided in a major, 
um, because they often choose the arts and sciences open option. I also coordinate outreach events such as this and serve as the scholarship administrator for a variety of the scholarships that we offer. Um, I have worked with students with disabilities in K through 12 as well. All four of us have taught college courses at various times and we're all K-State alums. So we understand the culture and the process here, which is very helpful to our incoming students. Angela Glean is our testing center coordinator. Um, many of you may have testing accommodations and we will talk about what that looks like in college in a little bit. Um, we do have a dedicated testing center just for our students. Other schools should also have a designated area for students with testing accommodations. Um, for us, Angela coordinates the exams, the times, um, the accommodations that need to be put in place, and then she facilitates any faculty interaction that's needed for anyone with those testing accommodations. So what kinds of things qualify? as a disability? This is a question that we often get asked. This slide gives you some examples of disabilities. Um, we typically break ours down into four categories. The first category being medical disabilities, which would include um, any chronic health conditions. That might include Crohn's disease, um, epilepsy, diabetes, um, heart conditions is another one that we're seeing more and more of after COVID, um, things like that. The second category would be physical disabilities. That can be permanent or temporary. Um, permanent examples would include like a loss of a limb, uh, hearing impairment, low vision, or even spinal cord injuries. Temporary examples might be a broken ankle, a broken wrist, post-surgery limitations. Um, and you'll find that the temporary ones are very common after spring break. Everybody goes skiing and comes home with some sort of an injury that we need to accommodate. Um, the third one is mental disabilities. That would include things like anxiety and depression, um, bipolar, even PTSD is a common one. And our fourth category would be learning disabilities. That would include dyslexia, um, central auditory processing disorder, um, reading disabilities, things like that. Not all students with disabilities register with our office because some don't feel that they need accommodations and that's okay. Um, but if you have any question as to whether or not you will need extra support, I would strongly encourage you to do it at the beginning of your educational journey. Um, the number that, of students that we serve just continues to grow. We had a one year growth rate from the fall of 2022 to the fall of 2023 of about 1.5%. Um, that put us over the 1,200 students mark um, between the four of us, and that's about 6.4% of the student population at K-State. Okay, so how do we get started? Um, you can really do it at any time in your educational journey, but as I mentioned, it's best to start inquiries when you're doing that application process or the sooner the better. Um, for us, it all starts with our webpage. Most schools will have a similar process. If you enter the word disability or disabilities into a search bar at your respective college, you should get a good idea where to start. Something will usually pop up. This is our homepage. It's kind of the center section of it. Um, and this is how you get started with our office. Uh, we'll go through the actual steps in just a minute, but I wanted to point out that these two buttons that register with the Student Access Center and that Student AIM portal, um, those two buttons on our homepage will get any student started and are kind of the home base when needing or working with our office. So that first one, register with the Student Access Center. By clicking here, you can fill out a brief questionnaire that gives us basic information about you and your disability. 
it puts your information into our specific software called AIM, which you see that referenced on that second button where it says Student AIM Portal. Um, this software is used by many colleges and universities. Your registration is then reviewed by our graduate assistants, and then you're assigned to an access advisor. Uh, for us, you are assigned based on your major. Other institutions may break it up differently. And then if accommodations are set up, you will then click the second box to request accommodation letters or if you need to schedule an exam with our testing center um, because you have testing accommodations. Okay, so now we'll go through each step of that process, keeping that uh, web page in mind. Um, the first step is to submit that online application with the Student Access Center, which is uh, that registration piece that I just showed you. And most colleges will have a setup like that or similar to that where you register with their office. Once you've done that, you are assigned to an advisor and the students are then asked to provide disability documentation, which is step two here on our list. Uh, this step may vary between institutions. For us, it's a very important piece in our process. We don't necessarily need to know details, but we need to know how the student is affected academically or in an academic setting. Documentation can include the IEPs or the 504 plans, as I previously mentioned. Um, it can also be psychological or psychoeducational evaluations. It could be letters from doctors or letters from therapists or even hospital reports just something that verifies that disability and how you're affected. Um, if none of those are available, we do have a disability verification form on our website that you can download. It's just a brief two-page questionnaire um, that you can give to a medical professional to answer a few questions about how your disability impacts you in the academic setting. If you can include the documentation and upload that when you fill out the registration piece, it will speed up the process. Um, but if not, we will reach out to you and ask you for it. It doesn't necessarily have to be done at the same time. Uh, the third step for a student is to meet with their access advisor. Uh, this is known as the interactive process. Advisors will reach out to you to schedule a meeting, either in person or via Zoom. In some colleges, you will um, be directed to a place where you can schedule an appointment with an advisor, so you may have to do that as well, depending upon the institution. Uh, the advisor will discuss challenges that you face, um, any previous accommodations that you might have had, and then possible accommodations at that university. We are already meeting with students who will be incoming for the fall of 2024, just to kind of let you know how far in advance that process uh, can actually occur. Um, you wanna keep in mind that there's no exact checklist. We might have two students who both have an ADHD diagnosis, uh, but have entirely different accommodations because the disability affects each person in a different way. And we wanna make sure that we address each person's specific needs. So it's not like you come in with a diagnosis and there's just an immediate checklist that goes with that. We do sometimes meet collaboratively to brainstorm together regarding accommodations uh, where all of us will get together and talk about a specific case um, to brainstorm ideas if there's a particular thing that we haven't seen before that might be a little more complicated than others. Um, but once accommodations are determined, um, the advisor then notifies the student of any decisions regarding those accommodations. Okay, so then we move on to step four. That's where the student will log back into our system through our webpage, through that second button that I showed you, uh, to choose the courses and accommodations that we want to implement and request letters to notify those professors. They get to choose which classes they get those accommodations for and which accommodations they need based on that class. Uh, access advisors then send letters to both the professor and the student 
so the student knows exactly when the professor is notified, and they also know exactly what the professor has been told. We then move on to step five, where we ask that students talk with their professors about specific accommodations, just to make sure that the professor and the student have a clear understanding of the accommodations and the expectations of the class. Because a lab class, um, a bowling class, and a lecture class are all going to be structured very differently. So the accommodation structure may also vary. So it's really important that they're both on the same page. Um, as would be expected, the Student Access Center is available at any time to assist the student or the faculty member. Uh, our initial process usually takes one to three days. Um, I would venture to guess that at most institutions, it's about the same. If nothing needs to change, each semester after that, the student would start at step four, where they can request those letters for their professors for each new class. And if something does need to change, then they would go back to step three and talk with their advisor and talk about any changes that might need to occur. So what are some accommodation examples in college and how are those different or the same as what they might be in high school? Well, one of our most popular um, accommodation items in college is called alternative testing. And this happens a lot in the high school setting as well. This may include additional time. It may be a separate area or a distraction reduced environment, which may or may not include our testing center. Um, it could also be possibly text to speech, depending upon what the student needs. So that's a very common one. Um, we do have alternative text as well. That's a good example. This would include like e-textbooks or accessible PDFs. That might be an accommodation if a student has a print disability like dyslexia or a visual impairment. We also have note-taking support. Uh, this might occur through an electronic recording device or a peer note-taker if a student has physical difficulties writing or um, you know, a physical limitation, that's an example. And then we have just regular classroom accommodations that can vary quite a bit. You might have an interpreter that could be provided for someone who has a hearing disability. You might have a table rather than a desk. If you have a student that's in a wheelchair, uh, you might have a classroom break that could be provided for a student who requires insulin. And while a classroom break is something that in college you typically could take whether you had that accommodation or not, uh, as an adult learner, many students find that it's very helpful to have that in their accommodations because that way, if they actually step up, step out and um, leave the classroom for a little bit, that their instructor knows there's a legitimate medical reason why the student is needing to step out and they're not just getting up and walking out of class because they're bored with the instructor. So they find that that kind of helps facilitate uh, communication. Every situation is different and every situation is decided on a case by case basis depending upon the student's needs. But those are some of, some of the examples that we typically give. So this is an example of what an accommodation letter looks like. This is what we send to the professor about accommodations that need to be put in place. And this is what the student's copy looks like as well. Um, the letter tells the instructor that this student is working with us and that we've determined that the following accommodations need to be put in place. It does not disclose a diagnosis, um, nor is that information disclosed anywhere in the K-State system. That information stays in our AIM system um, that is housed in our office because that's the student's information and they should get to choose who they share that information with. So if you choose to share that with your instructor um, and let them know what your disability is, that's entirely fine and that's up to you. But if you choose not to, that's fine as well. It just depends on your own personal comfort level. This is a picture of our testing center. 
Um, as I mentioned, that first page that I showed you with the web page, um, students schedule their tests online through that portal. And um, it consists of numbered stations with dividers. And as you can see, some are equipped with computer equipment for online or technology-based exams. Students will check in at the testing center office, which is right next door to our testing center, and they leave their smartphones, their backpacks, um, smart watches, things like that, coats, things like that um, in the office. The only items that go into the testing center are what they require for testing, like maybe a calculator or a ruler, or if the teacher has given them a formula sheet, things like that. Uh, students are then monitored by our staff via cameras, and then they can press a button if they need assist assistance or when they're finished. Um, staff then come to the testing center to retrieve the exam before the student leaves to get their physical um, personal items. And we do this so the exam never leaves that room unless it is in our possession. Uh, we have a very strict um, checkoff list that we go through, and that's so that we can ensure the authenticity of the exam. So that protects the student and the professor at the same time. Testing accommodations may also be done by the department. Sometimes departments will have enough students that need accommodations that they will set up a separate room for those themselves, and that's fine too, as long as the student gets the accommodations, it's whatever the student and the professor work out, but many times they will tell them to schedule with the testing center. Uh, but again, that's why we want the students to have that conversation with their professor once that letter is sent out so they, they can iron out all of those specific details. We do rent additional rooms during finals week um, where we do not have these dividers. Uh, we only have two people at a six foot table at a time, and usually we don't have a lot of overlap even with that, but just so uh, students know that, that we do have so many people that use our testing center, we do have to rent extra rooms during finals week. Some colleges or universities may have a block of rooms for testing accommodations. Some may have small offices or they may have more open rooms like this. Um, not all cam colleges will use cameras. It depends on the setup. Uh, for us, that helps eliminate a lot of the in and out, which minimizes distractions and things like that. But it just kind of depends on the institution, uh, what their needs are, how big their population of students with disabilities are. But those are some things that might vary from college to college. Just a couple more quick things that are K-State specific. Um, we offer read and write, and this is available to all K-Staters, regardless of disability status. Uh, it is available for Mac or Windows users um, directly from our website. It can be downloaded. If you scroll down to the bottom of our homepage, you will see some areas that are kind of like this. We have some gray boxes down there with different things. And you can download that once you've enrolled at K-State. It's a comprehensive literacy support tool that offers help with everyday tasks like reading text out loud, um, vocabulary, researching assignments, bibliographies. Um, you can figure it out pretty easily with just a couple of short tutorials that they offer. It's also helpful if you tend to learn more through auditory information or you need both that audio and visual input. It's essentially a floating toolbar. So it will read anything on the screen, which is really helpful for freshmen who experience a lot more reading than they're used to. And it's really quite useful, especially now that more and more professors are going to online textbooks. It's a great alternative, even if you don't have a disability, just so that it's not that constant reading or constant screen time or those kinds of things. It just gives you some variety, which can be really helpful in studying. Another one of our boxes at the bottom of the page uh, references our scholarships. Again, that's on our homepage. It's a three-part process that has to be completed each year by March 31st. A student does not have to be registered 
with the Student Access Center or be receiving accommodations to apply for a scholarship. They just have to have a diagnosed disability. Um, they do have to go into the K-State Scholarship Network and mark the box that says, I have a disability. And once they do that, it will prompt them for the two additional steps. They have to supply documentation if we don't already have it. If they're registered with us, we will have it. Um, but if they're not, then they just supply that additional documentation to us. And then there's a brief essay that goes along with it where they answer just a few questions um, for us. They can send that information to us and all those steps are outlined by clicking on that apply button under that scholarships headline. Incoming freshmen uh, can apply now for the 2024-2025 school year. Um, then after March 31st, that information is redacted and uh, made anonymous so that nobody's names or um, schools or anything like that are in their essays. And then those are presented to a committee and scholarship winners are selected and those winners are notified in June for the upcoming school year. And again, this is our contact information for anyone who missed it previously. Again, we're happy to answer questions at any time. It doesn't necessarily have to be related to K-State. We get a lot of questions about what kind of documentation is um, okay to use. Um, we, Like I said, we use IEPs, 504s. Um, it can be testing that you've had done. Um, you know, in junior high even, or even younger than that, if it's something that may not change over time, or it can be a therapist note, all of that information is also outlined on our webpage. You'll find that most schools will be willing to accept the majority of those as well. Um, but you can reach us at any of that uh, contact information if you have questions about K-State or if you have questions about disability accommodations in general. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and we can go to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Cherry. Um, I really appreciate you sharing all that information with our students. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, please put them in the chat or the Q&A box. I also have some questions as well that have been submitted by students and parents who were not able to attend today's meeting. So yeah, um, and to give um, our students time to post their questions, I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, one of the questions that came from a parent was, do all accommodations require documentation from a doctor? You kind of touched upon that, but just wanted to get a definite answer. Usually in our situation, we just ask that it be a, a professional in the field. So it can be a psychologist or a therapist or anybody maybe who does psychoeducational testing. Um, it can be, you know, someone at the hospital, those kinds of things. We just need that. We don't even necessarily always need a diagnosis. It's helpful. It, it kind of depends on what that is because we've had documentation in the past where someone might come and say, well, I have a mental health disability and that's what their documentation tells us. But a mental health disability, sometimes it's helpful to have that diagnosis because someone who has PTSD um, might need very, very different accommodations than someone who has depression. And so it's helpful for us to know that diagnosis, um, but that's not always the case. If we have a reading disability, it doesn't necessarily need to be defined as long as we know that it's a reading disability. Uh, a lot of times in order to get e-text, we do have to have something that shows a diagnosis that um, like dyslexia or something like that, because that's what the publishers require for us to be able to get an audio book. Um, but from the documentation perspective, as long as it comes from an expert in that field um, that relates to it, then that's good enough for us. So we get letters from therapists, we get them from psychologists, we get them from social workers that do um, therapy, those kinds of things, all of those different kinds are accept acceptable to us, school psychologists, things like that as well. Excellent. And I know a lot of universities have health clinics on campus. 
um, particularly to some students who travel long distances to live on campus. Would university health clinics also be able to provide that documentation? That's a really good question, and you have to check with them. Uh, for instance, Lafine, which is our health center, they will do testing for ADHD, but they do not do testing for any other kind of disability from a learning perspective. And so that would need to be done outside of their purview. Um, but they can also give us documentation if they have a patient that's being treated for anxiety or depression or things like that. So it's something that you would want to check with uh, that particular medical facility on campus and see how far they're services reach. That makes sense. Uh, for students who are considering either a public or private university, is there any differences when it comes to the status of an institution when it comes to providing accommodations? They should be governed the same way higher education is governed um, the same way, regardless. It's kind of like K through 12. Now, I will say, I know that in K through 12, with my experience with K through 12, that sometimes a private institution, um, an elementary school that like don't always have the same services. Um, they don't have the same budgets, and so they don't necessarily operate the same way. So if you're considering a private institution, I would definitely check it out beforehand, even if you don't think you're going to use the accommodations initially, um, because if you find yourself in that situation, you would want to make sure that you have those options available, but all of your public universities should have the, the same options available uh, regardless and you mentioned earlier that housing accommodations can also be made if a student requires them. Can you give some examples of what housing accommodations may look like? Sure. Um, housing accommodations can be a variety of things. So, for instance, if we have a wheelchair student, we might need an accessible shower. We might need um, an accessible desk. Uh, those might be different than what they would be in a typical dorm room, those kinds of things. Um, and that can vary depending upon the dorm or depending upon the housing situation. We do require our incoming uh, freshmen to have a year housing. And so that can be um, an issue related to that. We need to make sure that all of our accessible rooms are available for those who might need it. So that might be some of the accommodations that we'd need. Um, we might also have ESAs. Um, that's a little bit of a gray area, so um, that's not one that we typically elaborate a whole lot on because you really need to get documentation from someone um, other than just a medical professional. Not all medical professionals are licensed or um, trained in dealing with emergent um, with ESAs, and so that's one of the things that you. Uh, want to make sure that you go to someone who has that training for um, an emotional support animal. And so we do have those, um, but there are some strict guidelines that have to go along with that uh, as it relates to um, vaccines being registered with the city um, and the documentation that goes along with that. Uh, sometimes the housing accommodations are due to um, maybe a dietary need. Um, we have dietitians that work with them because of food allergies or uh, specific needs that are related to um, dietary needs or maybe an illness or something along those lines as well. So that can vary pretty widely um, depending upon the needs. Um, but those would be some of the, the examples that would go along with that. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I know sure. I had a couple students ask about emotional support animals, so that's a great uh, topic to go into, particularly when you're in the process of looking at a university, making sure the housing options fit your needs. Um, yeah, and I would really, I would really say that um, from an emotional support animal um, standpoint, you really want to check with each university and see what their guidelines are. Uh, see where those animals are allowed to go 
uh, are they allowed to, you know, be in certain areas on campus? Are they not allowed to be in certain areas on campus? What are those requirements? Do they have to have vaccines? Do they have to be a certain age? A lot of times we have students who maybe just got a puppy for Christmas and they want to bring that puppy back and they're like, oh, this is my emotional support animal. Um, and it may be, but there's just some guidelines that need to go along with that. So you want to make sure that you explore that fully um, without making assumptions. Great. So another question, um, you mentioned a lot of different accommodations that students can receive as a college student. Um, from a financial standpoint, do any of the accommodations that your office offers, does that cost the student any additional money? No. Uh, there are some things like we have noise canceling, canceling headphones um, that are available to students that they can use so they can use ours. They can check out the, that equipment. Many times the students want to buy their own. And so in that case, they may spend their own money to do that. Um, but no, they don't have to pay for us to provide a table in the classroom. They don't have to um, pay to have a peer note taker. In those cases, a lot of times we'll ask for volunteers. If we have people that are willing to take notes as a peer note taker, they can actually get um, a notice from us saying that they volunteered their time. And that can be very helpful for them if they're applying for scholarships or if they're in a sorority or fraternity where they have to do community service. So they're going to class anyway and taking their own notes, but they're getting some additional um, credit for that as well. And so that can be helpful, but that does not cost the student anything. That's great to know. Um, and you mentioned the process of requesting accommodations requires the student to speak with their professors after they get that letter from your office. At any point, is a professor allowed to decline the student's um, request for accommodation? You know, what I usually say is that if a student, part of that is because we have so many students, it's impossible for us to be able to make all of those one-on-one -on -one connections with them. And we're not in that classroom. And we feel like it's very important for those students to develop that rapport with the professors. But what I usually tell my students is, when you get that letter, it opens the door for you to have that conversation because now you know that your professor knows that there's accommodations that need to be put in place. So go to that professor and say, you know, I know you got my my list of accommodations. What are the things that we need to talk about? And kind of leave that door open for them. Um, but if you run into any problems whatsoever, I want you to come back to me because that's my fight to fight if there's a problem with that. Um, it's not yours. We don't want to ever create a situation where there's any um, confrontation between the professor and the student. Um, so I always tell them, you know, come back to me if you feel like you're not getting your needs met or you're feeling like um, there's some conflict there. But to be honest with you, it's very, very rare. And usually it's only in situations where maybe they just don't understand and they need a little clarification. Based on how our letters are worded, they know they can reach out to us anytime. So it's not uncommon for me to get an email from a professor that says, hey, I got you know, my accommodation letter for this student. What exactly does this mean? Um, most of the professors know. I, I don't know. I can't speak to other institutions in that regard. Um, but we just feel like it's very important that they have that open dialogue so that they know what to expect. For instance, um, one of the accommodations is reasonable attendance. And that's very rare that that accommodation is put into place. Um, but if you have a student perhaps maybe that has epilepsy and so they might miss a class because of that, that might be put into place. But the word reasonable is very subjective. And for certain classes, let's say like for student teaching, attendance is very important. That's part of the class. That's part of what's needed in order to meet those learning objectives. So that might be very different than a bowling class per se. And so it's really important that the student and the teacher make sure that they both understand what that means for that class. Gotcha. And as a formal work study student, how does the accommodation process look like if a student wants to work on campus? Would they also go to your office for accommodation help or would that be through a different department? 
that would always be something that you would want to ask at each institution. At our institution, um, we only work with the students and their disabilities. For any of the students who are considered work-study students in that particular situation, they go through HR. So our graduate assistants or our student workers go through HR if they need accommodations for their work, but if they need accommodations for class, then they would go through us. And um, we really focused on the importance of self-advocacy, particularly when you get to college. Do you have any tips for a student who might be shy, maybe doesn't have a lot of self-confidence and in interacting with older individuals? Some tips for navigating self-advocacy? Um, actually, one of the things I would say, and it sounds kind of silly, but I would say practice. Um, practice with your parent, practice with a friend, practice with your stuffed animal. Um, practice with your pet, those kinds of things. It can be really helpful just to practice in that regard and kind of um, know in advance how you want to approach that. I would also say write things down so that you're not nervous when you go. A lot of times we find, especially for our incoming freshmen and our kids that went through COVID, that they're very intimidated by the professors. And so we really coach them a lot about you know, if you need to talk with an academic coach and practice those things with an academic coach here before you go see that professor or write them down. Or if you really feel like you can't approach the professor, do it through email. You have those options to address them through email as well. Um, use those office hours, if at all possible, to develop that rapport. It is intimidating, and we do understand you're going through a lot of change when you first come to campus and those kinds of things. Stop by our office. We're happy to talk with you through those questions. We're happy to talk with you about how to approach um, a different professor, you know, if there's a particular need, those kinds of things. Um, but as silly as it seems, practicing and writing things down can be very simple uh, and good ways of doing that. If you have a particular uh, teacher in high school or a counselor, maybe, or even a coach, ask them for five minutes and say, you know, when I get to college, I'm going to need to do this. Can you help me with that a little bit? Um, most of them are going to be more than willing to help you get there. It is a big step. Um, you know, there's there's something about turning 18 and all of a sudden the world thinks that you can make all these decisions on your own. Some colleges um, will interact only with the students and we deal with the students. But if your parent wants to sit in on your meeting with us, we're OK with that. Um, you probably can't take them to class with you or with your meetings with your professors and things like that. But uh, I would I would say practice and write them down and, and, and see if you can find some avenues along those ways. Maybe start with your stuffed animal, work up to a coach or friend, and then when you get to campus, it's a little better thing. The other piece of advice I would say is that just remember this. You're not the first person to go through this, and you're not the last. So even though it's really, really scary for you, hundreds of thousands of people have done this before you, and in the big scope of things, they probably won't even remember what you said 10 years from now. So try try to just look at it that way and not worry about it. Yeah, that's a great way to approach that, especially with a very big time of change um, in a student's life. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A or chat box. So thank you, Cherry, for joining us today and sharing your time. Uh, thank you to those who have attended and thank you for those who are watching at home. If there's any questions, I will memo Cherry shared her contact information for the office of, at Kansas State University. There will also be a document shared in the description box that will include links to the university's disabilities offices across the KC Scholars Post-Secondary Network. So please explore those options at the university you are looking at to possibly enroll at. And yeah, um, I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day and thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Brittany.